Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, kind of weird. I am totally jet lagged. Uh, I just got back from India, so I'm, forgive me if my, my humor seems a little off. Really quickly, I was just going to show some stuff I've done over the years just uh, as an introduction to what I do and what I do now. Um, I spent about six years in Iraq and then five in Afghanistan, and I've done a bunch of different conflict zones over the years. And this was like a lot of the bread and butter sort of work that I did um, in Iraq. And at the time, this, this was shot uh, August 4th, 2007. I have a 40 pound uh, level 3A body armor on, plus two uh, heavy camera um, bodies, a video camera, an audio recorder, first aid kit, um, backup. I had a backup film camera as well, just in case. So I'm walking around with about 70 pounds of gear. Um, at the same time, trying to think about uh, making images. And uh, this is um, in Afghanistan, in uh, a, uh, a former Soviet cultural center, which was, um, became a, 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 heroin, a, a heroin den, basically. About 2,000 men, ages 16 to 70, would, would just smoke the purest form of, of heroin, uh, uncut. And I actually had seen this ray of light coming out of uh, coming out of an artillery hole in the side of the building. Uh, and I was there at 10 a.m. on one day, and it was kind of just coming straight down. So I was like, I need to go back at 5 a.m. the next day and watch as the light comes up through this whole building. And of course, this is the basement, so it's just filled with secondhand heroin and, and opium smoke. Um, and I spent five hours watching this ray of light until I realized I was completely high. Um, but don't do heroin unless it's in Afghanistan. Um, so I, I spent a long time in Iraq, six years. Um, I did a, a, a giant project um, where I love my mother uh, to death. I always preface this story. You've probably heard this story. So uh, Iraq, obviously a dangerous place. The road from the airport road in Baghdad from where you landed at the airport to get to your hotels was for about three years the most dangerous road in the world. Like guarantee if you were driving down this road, you would get hit by small arms fire. And to, to deal with this, they had basically what you, you know, you have a New York City bus covered with 80 tons of explosive armor on top of it. It's called a rhino. And basically it weighed so much that when you press the gas pedal, the, the bus started going about two days later. Um, and you would only, there's no space inside it. And you would just take the most important stuff. So it'd be like my computer, a satellite dish, my cameras. And you'd have your backpack with your gear, your clothes hanging outside the vehicle. Well, of course, as luck would have it, we came under fire, and my bag with my pants and my underwear got blown off the bus. Made it to my hotel, realized I have no clean clothes. I'm married at the time, but for some reason, I called my mom, because I knew my wife would not entertain this whatsoever. I called my mom, I was like, Mom, can you go to the Gap and get me a pair of bootcut jeans? and FedEx them to Baghdad, because FedEx worked. And this is the part, like, I love my mom, right? And she was like, Ben, why can't you go to the mall? I was like, Mom, it's, it's Iraq. There's, there's no mall. There's two escalators in the entire country, and they don't work. Um, and she's like, but Ben, I don't know that, because all you do, I was working for the New York Times, she's like, all you do is photograph like operations and bomb blasts, and you go to hospitals and funerals, like I don't know what the rest of Iraq looks like. So I was like, okay, next time I'm in a car, I'll photograph outside the window, and I'll show you what, what, what Iraq looks like. And it became like a six-year project, which I eventually made into a book, of shooting outside every Humvee window that I, I went through. Um, another chapter to the book became uh, uh, with night vision. I have, I'm a combat medic, and uh, I had the distinct honor to spend a lot of time with U.S. Special Forces, and uh, they'd always go out on night operations. And um, there's always some guy who stays back, right, for the quick reaction force, and they have extra gear just lying around the, the base. And I'd be like, can I borrow that night vision goggle? And they'd be like, sure, why, why not? So, uh, and my wife, uh, it, it always stories come back to this, like, 
She's from the Philippines. She kind of grew up in a hut. And she re when she came to the US, she was like totally all about hygiene. Uh, and she would pack dental floss in all my toiletry bags because she knew I would never take it. And I don't floss. But dental floss is an amazing tool for attaching a night vision goggle to your camera. Of course, my Nikons actually smelled like spearmint for, for about three months of every tour that I was on. Um, and so like, I, one of the things that's really important, and I think it's important as a photographer, is to embrace all the technological changes that come along. It's one of the reasons why I use Sony's now, and I don't use SLRs in the same way. And it's why, like, in Libya, um, I started using the iPhone. Now, I was actually working for Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera was the only um, company at the time that was trying to live broadcast from the front lines in Libya as the rebels were fighting Gaddafi's forces. And the cameraman and I were like, ooh, we can make a doggle and get a Wi-Fi router and have a Wi-Fi signal inside the trenches. And we actually ended up like just piggybacking every kilometer and a half. There was another satellite truck. And we had a Wi-Fi signal in the middle of a battle. So I'd be like hunkered down. There'd be bullets flying overhead. And I'd be able to like get on Instagram and, and post images. And so I shot a lot of, um, of Libya and the fall of Tripoli on just my iPhone. This is uh, Hurricane Sandy here in New York. Uh, you know, I think it was one of those things where Time Magazine like really saw the writing on the wall and said like, okay, if the Arab Spring was like, was really Twitter's time to shine, well, like something like a hurricane that has no backstory. There's not like a hurricane's not evil. Doesn't it's not malevolent. It doesn't have any. You can't write a deep penetrating reason about why Hurricane Sandy decided to up New York. I mean, it just it did. So they were like, this is going to be a real visual story. And we want you to go out and shoot it. And they actually gave me and four other photographers the entire passwords and keys to the kingdom of time.com. We didn't have an editor. It was basically like, just do an upload on your own. And hashtag Sandy was, uh, there were 10 pictures every second, I believe, uploaded with hashtag Sandy during the first three days of the hurricane. And, uh, this ended up becoming the cover of Time Magazine, which was the first time that an iPhone picture had been published like that. But more than that, I, I, I remember, I was like, I had two choices. There was all these guys, this is off of Coney Island, and everyone had like their super 300s, because everyone was trying to dance in the surf as these crested waves came in. And everyone has like super long lenses covered with hefty bags and like trying to stay dry. And I'm just like wearing like a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. And I put my phone in a Ziploc bag and I like waved to everyone. I knew all of them, but I just walked in front of them and just went straight into, uh, went straight into the surf to photo this group. He just came over the border from Mexico. And the reason he was in the water is like he had never been in the Atlantic before and he had never seen a hurricane. So he's like, this is awesome. I love it. Um, so obviously, after like 12 years of doing conflict work, I had my own fair share of PTSD. And I started doing a lot of sports. I have like a lot of people who kind of helped me get through it. And uh, ESPN and a bunch of, this is Harper's, and a bunch of other people really saw like, I am trying to do these long-term projects on sports as conflict resolution. Because sports photography is, in, in a way, is very much like doing conflict photography. You just have to be there in that moment and capture, capture this peak storytelling idea. So um, I had the opportunity to go to Sochi and photograph every single event, which is hard. And basically, you would sleep for like two hours a night. And actually, all those stories about how horrible the hotel rooms in Sochi were were totally true. Um, I had one power outlet that worked. If I plugged in more than two camera battery chargers, I blew out the whole floor. So I would be like one at a time and like set my alarm for every hour to get up, put a new one in. My bathroom, uh, I think, was installed by Willow or other hobbits because in order to shave, I had to do like this deep squat to see the mirror. Uh, it was all fun stuff. So, but my whole idea of sports photography, because it's very much controlled, is that you know wherever I see all the tons of other photographers, I don't go. I just go someplace else. So sometimes that works, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. With the ski jump, I went under the lip of the ski jump because, like, no one was there. Why not? It can be a cool. The only picture I made was like, 
pieces flying away from me in the night. And, and you know, it just didn't look right. It was just like a pair of legs and then <laughs> into the, but then something like this, like I, I actually um, was slope qualified and I had crampons and an ice pick and I was able to like climb up and uh, on the side of the aerial mountains where they go down and make, and make these images. Incidentally, after I shot this, I had to go down for figure skating. Um, and so I had my crampons and my ice pick in a think tank pouch. I had like taken the lenses out and I put my crampons inside it. And I'm shooting the, the ice skating and the Russian team had won. And there's like kind of a commotion next to me as I'm photographing them. And I stand and I turn and Vladimir Putin is standing next to me. I really quickly walk over, I take a portrait, and he winks at me and walks away. And I realize I had like a crampon on my belt. I could have changed the world. <laughs> I mean, you'd never see me again. Um, but a lot of like my photography is all about trying to see something different. Like trying to photograph something we all know what it looks like. We know what sports is, we know what speed skating is, but how can you shoot it in a different way? And that's key to being like a successful photographer these days is presenting the world a little bit differently, you know, uh, than what people are used to. And that's how you make your images stand out. So about a year ago, I, I got my first, uh, my first um, Sony gear and I started playing around with it. And like, damn, it's awesome because I don't have scoliosis anymore. Like, I can walk around with a couple of bodies. I just came back from climbing uh, glaciers in Iceland. And I can't show those pictures because they're under embargo. But I went with one backpack that had four bodies and six lenses in it. And I was able to, like, have that all on my back and climb with all the technical gear that I had. And it didn't weigh anything. And that's, like, one of the great aspects of using these smaller camera bodies. This is at um, a horse jumping competition in LA. Uh, I was kind of like standing under the horses, and one of the trainers comes up to me. He's like, uh, you uh, don't photograph horse jumping all that much, do you? I was like, uh, no, I don't. This is my first time. He's like, oh, yeah. I was like, how did you know? He's like, well, uh, you see those photographers over there in the corner looking scared? He's like, yeah. He's like, those are horse photographers because they're scared of horses landing on them. It's like, ah, we'll see what happens. Uh, this is in Ferguson. Um, my son, he, he, he was five years old at the time, has, has a, I, I think, you know, five-year-old kids and little toddlers have no sense of skin color or of all these other that we put on socially that we make for ourselves. And he loves superheroes. And he just knows this, like, clean-cut black and white of, like, good versus evil. And he's like, Dad, I don't understand what's going on over here in Ferguson. Like, he watched the news, and I was like, well, you know, sometimes you have good guys who are bad guys, and sometimes bad guys are good guys, and it's different. It's like a different world out there. He's like, I don't get it. I was like, you know what? I will go photograph it for you. And I went out to Ferguson for just one day with just my, my, my Sonys. And it was, it was actually kind of interesting because I'm using one of the, the RX1R, which I love, which has the viewfinder that you can flip up and you look down like an old school Hasselblad. And no one knew if I was like a protester, a tourist, a photographer, and more than that, like I actually like that now, that people don't know what I am. I mean, in Iraq, like I was like Jason Bourne. There's nothing, I couldn't escape it. Like everyone just saw me as like, he's either a soldier or something else, but like I didn't blend in. And then when I shoot here in America, like, I almost don't want to be, have, like, a huge camera with a lens hood and be like, that's a photographer. No, I just want, I want to, like, I almost want to be a tourist. I want to walk around with a camera around my neck and be like, blah, blah, blah. And then people just don't take me seriously. Um, I had a really great opportunity to go down to the Straits of Magellan near Antarctica to, like, hunt for pumas and penguins, which are two totally different animals, but uh, this was a lot of fun. This is in Iceland at uh, the Iceberg Graveyard. And I, I actually did a test with this. Um, I printed this 60 by 40 straight out of the camera. Like, no changes whatsoever to the image. Ginormous print. It's hanging on the wall of my bedroom because I didn't know what else to do with it. So I have to look at this every day, actually, when I wake up. This is, uh, actually, this is with the A7R. And it's shot, uh, I, I rented a plane, 
And these are uh, braided rivers in Iceland coming down from the volcano. And I just had the plane bank completely 90 degrees, so it's straight out, down, out of the window, looking straight at these rivers. Uh, this is Venice Beach. I'm a, I'm a big fan of like people walking through light that I find. And sometimes, specifically these smaller cameras, uh, a lot of times when I would shoot in conflict zones, like people see me. There's nothing I can do. You know, in street photography in different places, you know, I stand out. I'm just like a big dude. What, how do I do it? And I used to smoke. And, and then when I got into fitness, I would be like fake smoke. I would just move my hand like this. For like 10 minutes, I would just do this. Because all of a sudden, I'd become like part of the scene and people would just ignore me. So now I have like these small little cameras and I just kind of like fiddle with my hands or I check my phone or I pretend I'm listening to music and I'm just like this and I stand in a corner and the world just sort of forgets about me. I think I was actually jogging when I took this image. And again, it's, it's one of these cameras that you can take with you everywhere. So, uh, I mean, yes, I do conflict work, and it scarred me for life, and blah, blah, blah. But um, I also photograph my son, who's like a great model. He's had more Newsweek covers than I have. Um, he actually, he's, they called him racially ambiguous. And when he was a baby, he kind of looked like a little sumo wrestler. And uh, he got into like all these little catalogs so that friends of mine would take. Um, this is Halloween last year. Um, and, you know, like, one of the things that terrifies me more than going to any conflict zone is shooting on the New York City subway. So here's the thing. The first, when I first started shooting, I was living in, in Paris with a girlfriend. And I was like, oh, I'll go to Rue Saint-Denis and take pictures because why not? That's what we should do. And uh, the first day of me photographing, I got chased by a giant dominatrix in like a purple leather bodice. Like two blocks, she's like chasing after me with this huge purple paddle. And it scarred me for life. Every time I take pictures, I like think about being chased by a giant dominatrix. Um, I feel like my therapist would have like a great heyday with this. But so what I do uh, for practice, like when I'm, I just come back from India, I have no problem walking around the streets in India and shooting because if someone in another language is saying, I will kill you if you take my picture, I don't understand what they're saying. So I do it anyways. In America, I know what you're saying. And then I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, what I do is I actually force myself to shoot on the subway every day because it's the hardest thing in the world for me to do. Um, and or in gas stations. I love gas stations. But I, that is kind of key is like for me is forcing myself every day. Like shooting in war zones or shooting on assignments is sort of easy. That's a give me. Every, every place you look around is a photograph. When I'm in India, every, everything is a photograph to me. Um, finding the foreign in the familiar is that this is just like two blocks from here. Uh, it's like down the road. It's just like finding the familiar in the everyday and trying to make an image. And that's, that's sort of key. In, in my kind of understanding about photography, is that we have to make images and not take them. The idea is if there's a car accident right now outside, we're all going to run out and pull out our cameras and take an image. Take the first thing that we think of and just react. And if you're a photographer and you're like, you're trying to present this vision to the world, you want to make the image. You want to not set it up, but use your abilities in your own head to control what you see, creatively control, know your aperture, know your shutter, your ISO, your light, your color, your perspective. I'm tall or I'm short. And you make the image so that when you have an image, people are like, whoa, I did not even see that. And you show them a whole new world. And that's what makes you uh, successful. Like, that scared the shit out of me when I took that picture. I remember taking that picture. It scares me when people look at me. I would rather just have a Harry Potter cloak of invisibility and no one see me. But like having, you know, talking with someone after I shoot, no problem. But when I'm shooting, I'm like, ugh. But the subway is just like the, one of the most fun places to shoot for me. He was okay. He was a little strange. He just stayed there. 
continuously. I was like on this one platform for an hour because I had really nice light, and he was just watching me. Um, I thought he was going to report me for something. So this has happened a lot. The scariest assignment I've ever had in my life was for Stern Magazine, the German version of Time. And basically, they were like, oh, Ben, I'm not going to do a German accent. But they're like, can you go to all the playgrounds in New York City and photograph kids playing in parks for our travel issue? And I was like, can I get a black trench coat to do this? Um, I was like, no, I can't, I can't think of anything more terrifying than photographing kids playing in parks in New York City. I actually hired my wife as an assistant to like, go talk to all the mothers before I even came into the park. And like, then, I, then I would have the trench coat and pull out the lens. Yeah. Gay pride parade. I had a lot of fun with these guys. And you know, sometimes when you have like, an interaction, then you kind of like, feed off each other. And, the gear didn't get in the way, and I was just like, let's do a wedding photo. The, the uh, waiting on the platform, and when the door is closed, then I rush up to the window and take pictures. She can't run out and like, get upset at me like the dominatrix. She's stuck. She's like an unwitting model for three seconds. Now, uh, New York is awesome, I think, for like pools of light. Like this is, I love doing this. I just love, especially this time of year, sort of fall into winter, you end up having like super crisp light and it gets, you get these little canyons of light in New York City because of all the, the buildings. And you can just stand there and expose for the highlights and just go crazy with people walking through shadows. Kind of one of my favorite things to do. Cheerleaders, always fun as well for general reasons. And again, my son, I always like, this was on my Father's Day hike. So again, having all this, this is all shot with Sony, and it's so like I just had it while we were hiking. And like I'm teaching them how to like read trail markings and do all this stuff in, in the woods. And at the same time, I can have like a little high quality camera that I can pull out with me and shoot. This is not my son. In Williamsburg, yeah, and is it still there? Okay. Uh, I love shooting in snow because uh, flash and snow is when, or rain is just like, it's, it's fun because we don't actually see the world like this. And I think it's one of these things, there are always these discussions now, especially in photojournalism about like, what is truth? And, you know, should we give awards for this? Or if something's in black and white or it's color? And like, I think, I mean, that becomes a theoretical conversation and everyone's going to have, I have five minutes. So it's a theoretical conversation that we can't have in five minutes, but here is where my two cents is, uh, nothing is true. Everything about photography is artifice. We experience a three-dimensional world and we're putting it into two dimensions. Right there, uh, we're not presenting anything real. Uh, you can shoot with a 14 millimeter lens and make my nose look like the Empire State Building. The camera really did capture it. My nose does not look like the Empire State Building. So, you know, it's, it's about trying to show the world in a unique way while, at least from a photojournalist or documentary perspective, is like while trying to retain some truth, some idea of like this contract we have with the public to present, this, the, you know, a correct story. I had a very weird assignment uh, for Harper's Magazine where they had a story uh, fiction piece about like someone who wanted to commit suicide off the Williamsburg Bridge. And they're like, can you go walk on the Williamsburg Bridge uh, and just make weird esoteric images about trying to commit suicide? And I was like, I couldn't put myself in that mindscape, so I was just photographing runners. Like silhouettes of runners. Like they're running to their death. So this is um, the only stuff that I can show that isn't on embargo is the stuff I just did in India. Uh, so this is just like street photography in India that I shot for World Tourism Day over the last month. Uh, this is in Hyderabad. I actually love that sh she was actually shooting also with an iPhone. Which I've, everyone, everyone shoots everything now everywhere. Uh, this is um, a pet horse. This is his family's pet horse. Um, it's like Fido. Just lives in their front yard. 
This is in Bandra. It's kind of the hookup spot for teenagers in Bombay. It's like they all kind of huddle there and try and hook up while no one's looking because most people still live at home. It's like every time I would try and photograph people hooking up, they'd like cover themselves up and turn away. I was like, ugh. Now, uh, in a place like India, I just stick out so much that people just stare at me. Like drooling coming out of their mouth. They're like, wow. I, we, the writer I was with lost count after 50 of how many people took selfies with me. Just like I'd be out shooting and people would be like, oh, can I take a picture with you? It's like I had, I had a father drive up on a motorcycle with this little kid and was like, can you sing happy birthday to him? It's his birthday. We want, we want you to sing to him. I was like, okay. Or like people would peel up my sleeves. I was like texting my wife and I'd feel someone moving my sleeve up because they wanted to photograph my tattoo. Like just no one even asked. I was like, oh, hi. Sure. Like I just have babies thrust in my hands. I'd like hold them and be like, so I just, I just worked with it. At some point, I was just like, F like, all right, you take a picture of me, I'm taking a picture of you. But one of the things I found was really interesting. People would look at me like this. And then as soon as I smiled, I was like, ha, ha. They'd be like, ah. They'd smile right back. But before, that's when I took the pictures, before the smile, when they still have no idea what I'm doing. This is my taxi driver to the airport to come home. So I actually, I'm sort of one of these people like I always have a camera on me, except when I'm talking at the expo. Like this instant, I don't have one. But most of the time, I always have a camera on me uh, to photograph whatever I see. So this is my latest project, which I've been doing for a few years, which is like conflict resolution through sports. And a lot of it is fighting. And, and wrestling. Um, I've done a lot of cage fighting myself, and then now I'm sort of interested in wrestling. And uh, of course, I show up at these places, this is in India, and they're like, oh, your ears are not cauliflower. Like a good mark of any wrestler is having really messed up ears. And mine are fine, uh, because I'm not that hardcore into it. And they're like, well, we don't know that you can wrestle. So of course, uh, the one photograph I did not include in this presentation is of me in the loincloth wrestling. Because once you see that photo, you can never unsee it. And I, I don't want to like hurt anyone. But I had to wrestle. And then once I wrestle and throw a couple of guys down, I had to lose. Of course, I had to lose. Um, I lost really badly. They destroyed me. Um, but, and then I was like able to like really, like once you get into the talim, which is a sunken dirt floor, uh, it's like a holy area. And um, they don't let a lot of people in there. So it was really a, a really great opportunity to be able to do that. So this is, this is as epic as it gets for me, is like being at like five in the morning in this wrestling uh, temple. And I love the feeling when you get to a space and you look at it and you're like, I have no idea how to make this picture work. I remember standing there and be like, I have absolutely no idea how to line all this up. I don't even know what the picture is. This is just an epic scene of just like a bunch of burly dudes, sweaty, covered in stuff. I was really overwhelmed by the whole sight. But guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.